Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World Wanderers Podcast. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by you, the listeners of the show. We are so grateful for every single person who supports us on Patreon. If you want to be a Patreon supporter, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash the world wanders. As well as getting a copy of all of our ebooks, you also get one on one hangouts with Ryan and myself and postcards from exotic places around the world. So if that's something that interests you in supporting the podcast, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the world wanders. Now, on to today's episode. What are we talking about, Ryan? So today we have combed the internet to find some travel questions to answer. Yeah, so we went on Quora.com. If you're not familiar with Quora, it's Q-U-O-R-A.com. And it's a website where people can post any questions they want. So in searching travel questions, we found a lot of things about time travel, um, traveling at the speed of light, et cetera, et cetera. But we also found some really great questions that people out there are asking about traveling. So today we're going to answer some of those questions for you. The first question is... um after you've quit your job to travel for a year, does it make it harder to get a new job? What do you think? So this is all about how you frame it. So for us, we've both um, quit our jobs to travel. Well, one time we didn't have jobs going in, but we both have long gaps on our resume that we used for travel. And it's all about, one, what you're doing when you're traveling You know, is it a purposeful thing or is it just meandering around? Um, And two, how you tell that story. Like if you come back and people are like, oh, what have you been doing for the last year? And you didn't put it on, you know, you didn't like put anything about it on any of your application stuff. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I like went to, um, you know, Asia for a year and just kind of like bummed around and went to the beach. People aren't going to be like, oh, this is someone I want to work for me. But if you can show that like, hey, I, you know, I went off for the past year and I did a lot of personal development and I wrote a book and I learned Spanish um, and it was, you know, an amazing experience. And now I'm realizing a a different way I want to take my career. And that's why I'm excited about the business that I'm applying for right now. Um, If you can tell your story that way, then it's something valuable and uh, a positive. And the other element, the kind of final piece I would add is it's also a good kind of like self-selecting criteria. The reality is if, if a business looks at your resume and says, oh, wow, this person just spent the last year traveling, those aren't the types of people we want working for us. As a person who travels, those that's not the business you want to work for. Um, so I wouldn't stress about the opportunities that it does lose you. I would just, you know, make sure to mindfully tell the story about the value you got of the, about the purpose behind the trip. Uh, and if you frame it in that context, then it's a massive positive. Yeah, I would agree with almost everything that you said. Um, the one thing that I don't necessarily agree with is I think you can go into a trip you know, just having the intention to take a gap year or to, you know, have an adventure. Maybe you have a bucket list and you're looking to take some of those things off. I think the inevitable thing is, is that you're going to have an experience that's much deeper than simply seeing the Eiffel Tower or seeing, um, you know, the Coliseum or something like that. And I think exactly as you said, it's about how you tell it. So it's the difference between, oh yeah, bro, I partied for a year and it was really sweet. And, you know, now I'm ready to work versus like, you know, telling that story in a way that really shows what you've learned from it. Because I think that even if you are on a party trip or a gap year, there's so many things you learn. There's like being on time for buses and crazy train rides and, you know, sketchy plane rides and meeting strangers and making friends with people that you've never met before. So I think it's all about how you frame it. Yeah. And if, if it's something you want to do, and the only reason you're considering not doing it is because of the fear that it might potentially be hard to get certain types of jobs afterwards. Um, I don't think that's a fear you should listen to. I think you should just kind of like throw yourself to it. But I know going into our South America trip, that was something we both thought about. I mean, I worried about. I was like, oh, you know, am I going to struggle to get a job when we come back? Am I going to be homeless? And that trip 
uh, and the time we had to kind of think about life and to learn new things led to a complete different change in direction. We ended up starting a podcast. We ended up moving to a different city. We ended up looking for a completely different line of work. Um, so the, the the fear I had beforehand was completely completely not valid because of the direction and change in light that happened on the trip. Yeah, and I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but I actually had a marketing professor who I worked closely with in my last couple of years of university who advised me not to take our first six-month trip. So we weren't even quitting jobs at that point. I was working you know, a previous summer job just to make some extra cash. And he said, you know you're going to have this gap on your resume and it's going to put you behind your peers. And I'm so grateful that I trusted my instinct and trusted my gut on that because I was like, no, this is something I told myself I was going to do years ago before I started school and I'm going to fulfill that. And exactly as you said, like if somebody doesn't want to hire me because of this gap, then I don't want to work for them. And, you know, people might tell you these things. And if you really feel like traveling is what you want to do, if a big backpacking trip or a big vacation is something you want to do, go with that. You always know what's best for you at the end of the day. All right. What's the next question? How does it feel to travel alone? How does it feel, Ryan? Um, it feels all kinds of things. So we have both taken solo trips and we both did it intentionally because we were at a point in our life where we felt like, okay, we've spent a ton of time together. Um, it would be interesting to go out on our own to see what that's like. And so we, we both did it. And I think there's kind of, it's more of like a, a bit of a roller coaster than it is when you're traveling with someone else who can kind of balance things out. You you do have a lot of fun. You you overcome a lot of challenges on your own, but it does get a lot lonelier. I, I think those like days when you're by yourself at a hostel and like there's not many other people in the room or you know the people who are there you aren't super friendly. Uh, you do feel a lot more isolated, and it's maybe a, a little bit less like fun and lighthearted in terms of the way it feels. But I think the thing that we both experienced and most people we've talked to is that those solo travel experiences are such valuable personal development times um, because of that, because you have to be completely self-sufficient and you don't have anyone else to lean on. You don't have any uh, anyone's strengths to cover up your weaknesses. You can't be codependent on anyone. And so a lot of times that feels uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good to be stretched outside of your comfort zone in the moment. But afterwards, it feels awesome. Yeah, I would 100% agree with all of that. And I think that everyone, you know, learns and grows in different ways from solo travel. I think for me, it was a little bit uncomfortable because I make a lot of decisions with other people and I have my entire life. So even, you know, I remember waking up in Bali and being like, okay, so I have nothing that I need to do today. And I can completely choose my entire day. And it felt so foreign to do that. I wasn't deciding what to do based on anybody else's opinion. I wasn't deciding when to eat based on anybody else's opinion. I was just like very much like, you know, when do I want to eat? What do I want to eat? What do I want to do? Oh, wow, this is actually kind of fun. Um, I think it also gives you the opportunity to meet other people a little bit easier. We've talked about this a number of times on the podcast, but I think sometimes, especially traveling as a couple, um, I think we miss opportunities to meet other travelers. And I think that when you're a solo traveler, you have a lot of opportunity to meet other solo travelers, to you know meet other groups of people, um, to find other people to eat with or hang out with or do activities with. And I think that being by yourself is an instant conversation starter versus having somebody that you know really well that you can just rely on. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question is, they're kind of two back-to-back -back questions around similar topics, but different angles. So uh, the first one is, um, what are the best ways to earn money while traveling around the world? Yeah, I think that that is becoming a more and more common question. I mean, it's something that the first time we backpacked, I was like, how do I become a travel blogger? How do I get rich and famous off of this? Still figuring that out. Um, but I think that there are a lot of different ways to make money while traveling. Um, I guess the first thing that I'll say, it's not necessarily making money, but just finding ways to do exchanges. So lots of hostels will do 
exchanges where you can work a couple hours at the hostel, maybe at the front desk or cleaning in order for your accommodation. Or you can do things like work away or woofing, where in exchange for, you know, farm work or some sort of work, you get your accommodation and your food. So those are very much like exchanging labor for something that you get, but it cuts down your costs a lot. Um, there's also things like you can get work visas in places. I mean, it depends on your nationality, of course, but, you know, Australia is a popular one for doing the working holiday visa. Canada is a really popular one for working holiday visa. You can get, you know, kind of menial like retail jobs or farming jobs and that sort of thing. Um, there are opportunities, I think, all over the world to work for cash, although that's something that you know, I would definitely do your research on um, anytime you're going to do some sort of illegal work. I think you need to be aware of the consequences of that. And I would probably not advocate for that, um, but it, it is an option. I'll advocate for it. <laughs> it's an option that's out there. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Illegal Work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the other things so that we do is we work online. So if you can find, you know, an employer that allows you to take your job remotely, you can do that. Um there's also freelancing opportunities working for companies or working for websites like Upwork and working for yourself, teaching English online with companies like VIP Kid. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can take your work online. And I think that for the most part, you're not going to get rich off of those types of jobs, but they really allow you to bring in some extra income while you're traveling, which can be really helpful. Yeah. So I, I would echo the second part of that. I think that more and more, as we go into the future, the best ways to make money while traveling are the best ways, best ways to make money when you're at home. Um, there's so many things you can do, um, side hustles, freelancing, part-time work that you can do online that you can find ways to do um, anywhere in the world. So if you're, if you're smart, if you have some skills, you can go on to places like Upwork or Freelancer and start building up a, a profile, whether it's doing something like uh, writing blog posts, editing, um, podcast editing, you know, basic design. There's um, resume creation. And, and you're not going to make much money when you start. You know, you're competing with people from all over the world. So the prices at the bottom end are very low. But if you invest some time and get a few clients and you come in with a, a legit background and great language skills that, that the people you're competing with don't have, you can quickly build up to a really solid rate that, especially if you're traveling places like Eastern Europe, Asia, South America, if you can make between 10 and $15 an hour doing copy editing or writing blog posts or doing basic design work, um, that's going to go a long way. And I, we've met so many people who uh, who are doing things like exchanges, like working in hostels and in small countries. And uh, one that jumps to mind is meeting this guy who was working at a hostel in uh, Quito, Ecuador. And he was just kind of like wearing himself out, working like 10 hours a day, actually overnight. It was like every night overnight. So he couldn't really sleep, had to sleep all day. He was doing it in exchange for accommodation. And we were like, we're paying like fifteen dollars a night for this place. I think it was under fifteen. And it like was like Canadian so dollars. cheap. So like I think those exchanges have non-monetary value. Some places like woofing. If if you're at a great place, there's a ton of non-monetary value. You get a great cultural experience. You get your accommodations, some food. Um, even the work experience can be very interesting. Doing things like woofing. Sometimes at hostels, there's a lot of that, but a lot of times there isn't. Uh, and a lot of times it makes more sense to just invest in doing cheap work online uh, to build up to a point where you can make more money. Yeah, I think just looking at what your skills are, what your interests are, what you're, you know, what you would feel like slightly excited to do, like what, what feels like something you'd want to do and then make the decision from there. Like to me, staying up all night in a hostel is not a very enticing idea. I would really rather work online, but for somebody else, you might be like, yeah, I would love to work in a hostel bar and stay up all night. Cause I do that anyways. So that might be, you know, something that excites you. So just looking at, you know, what you want, but knowing that there are lots of options out there. And if you just start you know, digging around on the internet, you'll find a lot of different ways to kind of hustle your way to get a little bit of money. Yeah. So the next question somewhat related is, um, how do people travel around the world if they're not rich? <laughs> this is probably one of my favorite questions that we encountered on Quora second to the uh, time travel ones. Um, I think that there is a really 
kind of big idea that's out there maybe not big idea but you know some people who haven't traveled kind of get this idea in their head that like oh you must be a trust fund baby or you know you must have like sold something or sold a business or a property or something like that in order to be able to travel and I think that there's a couple different things based on our experience that I want to touch on the first one is budgeting I wrote a blog post on the World Wanders a couple weeks ago about how to set and stick to a budget. And I think that budgeting has been one of the most successful ways that we've been able to travel. And I think that some of the key things around budgeting is really getting clear on what you want to do. So if you have a clear vision, like creating a vision board or something that you get to see every single day, like a reminder of, you know, I'm going to Peru and I'm hiking Machu Picchu, it makes it that much easier in your day-to-day life to not choose to buy things like lattes or new clothes or taking a cab when you could take the train or, um, you know, not going out for drinks with your friends or saying no to that second drink type thing. Um, So I think that setting a budget is definitely the first thing that I would say. And then the second thing is being able to work and travel. I feel like, you know, looking back at when we started traveling in 2011, we barely met like we didn't really meet people who were working online and now it's like we encounter people all over the world consistently who are making money online that allow them to fund their travels so I think again looking at those opportunities um, as how to make money allows you to bring in income while you're on the road and what I would add to that is that I think people uh, drastically overestimate how expensive travel is I think you know if you're from If you're from a developed country, you know, Europe, if you're from Canada, if you're from Australia, America, um, and you you do not have to be rich to travel well in a lot of places around the world. Um, You know, if you're from Thailand, yeah, the only people who are traveling internationally are rich people um, relative to that context. But, you, you know, you do not have to be rich or even really make that much money at all to travel from America and to make your life a lot cheaper. Um, to give you an example, our cost of living dropped dramatically when we went from being in Canada to traveling around in Asia, and our quality of life improved quite a bit. So um, there's a lot of places in the world where the cost of living is much cheaper. Accommodation is cheap, food is cheap, um, and, and actually moving around, the flights, the buses, the trains are, are much less expensive. The other factor that comes into play if, is if you do um, do long-term travel, uh, your income drops and your taxes drop. So if you do something like you know work for the first couple months of the year and then take the rest of the year off to go travel, uh, you're going to pay much less tax that year. And so the money you did make goes a lot further. Um, and that is just another way that supports the travel. So um, people drastically underestimate um, how cheap it can be to travel some places and how much savings you can get when you work for part of the year and stop because you're saving in taxes and able to use that to travel. Yeah, that's a really good point that I hadn't really thought of actually. Like I've I've obviously thought about it in my real life and really felt that, but I I didn't think about it for this answer. And that's a really great point. Um, And it's really awesome, you know, the years that we were working full time to be able to kind of like cut our income in half that year. And then you pay like not very much in taxes at all, if anything, depending on where you live, of course. So the next question is, which online travel services are changing the travel industry? (laughs) Theworldwanders.com. Just kidding. (laughs) Um, So for me, the things that really have changed the way that I travel are um, Uber, Uber Eats, Airbnb, and Skyscanner. I think those are probably my top four. Um, so Uber obviously is a transportation service. I feel like everyone probably knows about Uber at this point and it's really taken away this sort of sketchy element of taxis. So that was something that we worried about a lot when we went to South America. I remember arriving in Bangkok and being really paranoid about getting our stuff stolen. And I rarely, if ever feel any type of like uncertainty or fear when I get into an Uber. So that's kind of changed that, um, Uber Eats allows you to get you know, find really great places to eat. And um, there's so many, like there's Food Panda in Southeast Asia. Um, there's Rappi yeah, here Rappi. in Mexico. Yeah, and Mexico City also has Uber Eats, which is great. Um, what else did I say? Airbnb, we did an episode, I guess probably about this time last year, about how technology has changed the way we travel. And um, 
Airbnb is one of those services that has really allowed us to, you know, have privacy as a couple. Um, as we've gotten older and kind of transitioned out of not wanting to stay in hostels, it's allowed us to still have these really great experiences abroad, but have our own space. It's also made it really possible for us to work and travel. And it allows us to live in somebody's home, to not feel like we're always living somewhere that's really like sterile. And it gives us this opportunity to have more space, to cook our own meals. And yeah, I mean, Airbnb has really 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 improved my quality of life and it just allows you to stay in so many different areas of the city when you look at a map on airbnb there's certainly clusters around more touristic areas um, and deserts around places you don't want to stay Um, but just a much greater diversity in terms of the places in a city you can stay because anyone can put their place up and so it's not like a hotel where it's like there's a couple districts in the city where all the hotels are um, similarly with hostels, with Airbnb, you can get out and see so many interesting areas and have so many interesting experiences. Yeah, definitely. And then Skyscanner was my last one in that, you know, it allows you to, like, I can look up Mexico City to anywhere at any time or I can look up really specific things and it'll give me, you know, all the list of airlines with the cheapest flights. And I feel like it really allows me to get a good picture of what the prices are going to be like and see, you know, oh, the early morning flight with Spirit Airlines is really cheap in the U.S. versus, you know, the really good one with Delta is this price. And then I can go and I can book from those websites. So I think it just gives a really good overview, like one-stop shop for all the different flights that are available. Yeah, mine would be probably the the two that kind of blow everything else away would be uh, Uber and Airbnb, just because so much of our travel experiences kind of pre-Uber were... You know, taxis made for some interesting experiences, but also a lot of sketchy experiences. There's so many hassles, people trying to scam you. So much of that was around taxis. Um, just kind of like a cesspool of like shittiness that you had to deal with with taxis most places. And, and so Uber just kind of wipes that all away. And you have nothing but like, you know, pleasant, obviously bad things happen in Ubers still. Um, but so many more pleasant interactions, nice people, better cars, cheaper service. Um, and it just makes it so easy to get around no matter where you are in the world, uh, unless you're somewhere like Canada where they've banned all the Ubers. Um, and then the, the Airbnb, you touched I, on really well. Uh, we stay in so many Airbnbs now and it's made our lives so much better. Yeah. So I just have one quick little thing about Uber. So when we were in Bali last year, I mean, Bali... I don't know what it's like now, but they were having this massive Uber fight. I think it's still the same. Like the taxis don't want Uber there. Anyways, we took an Uber because we were like, no, we're pro Uber. And this Uber driver was like, oh, I'm going to take you like the faster route. And we're like, OK. I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, this is not the faster route. Like he drove us all the way like through the main city and whatnot. And I'm like, what on earth is he doing? And it's so great because we got back to our destination 30 minutes after we should have. And I just went on my Uber and I put like this driver didn't take the fastest route and Uber automatically like looked and was like, nope, he didn't gave me my money back, which means that driver didn't get that money that he was trying to hustle us for. And I feel like it just really keeps drivers accountable, which is really great. Yeah. And you just have so much more recourse. Like you don't have to get into an an argument, put yourself in danger. Um, You just, you know, say like, okay, bye, have a good, have a nice night. And then you can um, resolve those problems later in a much safer way. Yeah, definitely. And then um, the next question uh, is, what travel hacks have saved you a lot of money? Yeah, so, I mean, there's so many travel hacks out there. I think that one of the biggest ones that comes to mind for me is having points, like reward points on my credit card. Um, I've had so many free flights because of that. So basically, I have a couple different credit cards that all give me rewards points, and I charge pretty much absolutely everything that I pay for on my credit card. So it's like all my finances go onto my credit card and then I get points back. And so every couple of months I build up enough points that I'm able to book a free flight with that or book a flight that's discounted because of my points. And if you travel a lot, that is an amazing way to save a bunch of money. Yeah. If you're American and you, um, you know, have a full-time job right now and are planning up to go traveling. Uh, it's definitely, definitely 
a good investment of time to go research more on travel hacking. And we're certainly not experts at it. And when you're not in the U.S., um, the deals aren't aren't as good. Um, but uh, for people in the U.S., you know, from friends and fellow travelers, there's some like really awesome ways that you can save a lot of money. Um, a lot of it through points, um, credit card programs, all that type of stuff. So it's really worth investing in. Um, a couple that have one that we didn't take advantage of, uh, one that we did that, that saved us a lot of money was um, in Colombia when we were there the first time. And I think this may still be the situation um, where to take Viva Colombia flights, Viva Colombia is the domestic airline and it's very cheap, but it's uh, at the time you couldn't use a foreign credit card. Uh, so what you have to do to buy we thought, well, we were just like, okay, we're screwed. We can't do it. And so someone we were actually at the hostel with was like, oh, no, there's kind of this roundabout process where you can go to the grocery store. It's called Via Boleto, where you purchase it online. It gives you a number. Then you go pay cash at the grocery store and get the receipt and then receipt and your ticket there. Um, so by doing that, we were able to save a ton of money by being able to take the cheap um, discount area carrier in um in Colombia. I mean, it's the same in Mexico as well. Like, you know, anywhere that has a discount area, uh, discount airline. So Mexico is two. There's Viva Mexico, is it? Viva Aeroboost? Viva Aeroboost and Interjet. Yeah. And so being able to book through those is really, really helpful. It allows you to travel around the com- around the country super cheap. And they actually have a Via Boleto option as well you can go to one of the pharmacies or grocery stores and pick up your tickets or you can pay with a credit card um it just charges you a fee i opted for the uh, credit card fee because i didn't want to go do that whole process again but if you wanted to save even more cash you could um but things like spirit airlines in the u.s um or frontier ryanair in europe air asia in asia um, most countries have or most continents have some sort of discount airline carrier so looking up what that is and, you know, if you can be really strategic about how much your bag weighs and packing light and that type of thing, you'll save even more money with that, um, knowing that it's going to be very bare bones, but you're going to pay, you know, a fraction of the cost than an, another airline. Yeah. And then the other one that we didn't use personally, but heard about was in Argentina, they have, I think it's like a quasi government military plane airline thing um, where government planes will be moving from one place to other and you can buy tickets on them very very cheap uh and so you can find more about this on our blog post for argentina um i can't remember the name off the top of my head right now but um i remember we took a bus from um el calafate to bariloche and it was like a 28 hour bus ride and we paid something like you know 100 or 120 dollars for it uh, and we met someone who had paid something like $50 for a flight. So if you're in Argentina, um, definitely look up the the government airline and as a way, especially in Patagonia, to, to get around very cheap and very quickly. Yeah. Another more broad travel hack that I would say, and I kind of touched on this before, is if you can travel with just carry-on size baggage, you'll save a ton of money on baggage fees. It seems like airlines all over the world are now charging for baggage. So when you think about you know, 25 bucks every time you jump on a plane, um, it becomes a lot worth it to downsize from, you know, the 65 liter down to the 40 liter or the 50 liter. Um, Just doing your research to see what's actually accepted as carry on. But I think that that's a really good travel hack to save some money. And then the last one I'll bring up is uh, ATM fees. And it's something that I didn't think about on our first backpacking trip. But, you know, we took out money once a week, once every two weeks, and we would get charged a two fifty to three dollar transaction fee from the ATM itself, and then my bank would also charge that amount. So every time I was taking out cash, I was getting charged between you know five and eight dollars, and that adds up when you're traveling for six months and you're taking money out, you know, two, three, four times a month, and so. Looking at partner banks, um, you know, if you're Canadian, Scotia Bank is a really great one. It's got partner banks all over the world. HSBC is a great one. I think Charles Schwab in the U.S. is a really good one. Um, can you think of any other good ones? Uh, Charles Schwab is the one that I've heard the most about. Okay. Yeah. So just doing your research on that and seeing, you know, what banks are in my home country, what partner banks are there around the world, and maybe just even opening, you know, another bank account. Um, to you know, cover as many bases as you can to avoid those ATM fees. 
Yeah, and then so I'll I'll add one more to that um, kind of a, a different approach to take on it. Um, a travel hack. But the point of traveling is to enjoy yourself, to be happy, um, and a lot of times you can do that by not trying to save the extreme amount of money a lot of times whether it's booking the cheapest place you can stay at or going out of your way to do some sort of thing to get a free accommodation um, a lot of times investing a little bit extra money makes your life a lot easier maybe that's paying a bit more to stay closer to uh, a nice area so you don't have to spend less on taxis and have a more enjoyable experience or staying closer to the airport um, or booking a later flight so you don't have to get up so early so investing your money and taking into account the non-monetary value of things um, is something that I think a lot of people overlook. A lot of people go out of their way to save money while they're traveling and to scrounge all the pennies and, and end up putting themselves through like heavy costs and not enjoying themselves because of it. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously this question is about saving money, but I think sometimes it's like you know, you kind of touched on this. It's not always like the direct cost. So maybe you look directly at like, oh, this hostel is only $400 for a week and this hostel is going to be $600 for a week. But maybe that $600 hostel is way more central, which means you don't have to spend any time in transportation. That's going to not only save you time and hassle, but it actually will save you money in the long run. So sometimes looking at ways that you can just shift the way that you purchase. Yeah. All right. So I think that that's all of the questions that we have for now. If any of you have any questions out there, if you have any thoughts or different answers or different, you know, travel hacks or ways to make money on the road, um, definitely send us an email info at the worldwanders.com. As well, just want to remind you that we have a private Facebook community that's been super, super fun to have so far with lots of amazing like-minded people. It's called World Wanders, a community for travelers. There'll be a link in the show notes as well as the episode description, or you can just go on Facebook and search that and we'll let you in. As always, thanks for listening. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanders.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanders.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at WorldWanders1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.